Last week, me and Jeannie McIntosh visited the historic North Lancashire village of Wharton. This week, we've returned so that I can take Jeannie up the crag. What? Wharton Crag, classified geologically as a hump, is 535 feet tall. It's crammed with prehistoric archaeology, burial chambers, glacial deposits, folklore, all sorts of interesting stuff. Perfect for episode 26, or so we thought. At 11.30 hundred hours, we established base camp at the Old School Brewery, which we assumed was the grammar school recorded on Victorian maps. Because they offered cask beers, called Headmaster, Detention, Blackboard, and, for some depraved round the back of the bike shed's reason, Three Fingered Johnny. Following luncheon, which consisted of two jugs of English breakfast tea and a cold Mediterranean pie, it should have been cheese and onion, but apparently they stopped doing them. The total cost of which was an eye-watering six and a half quid. We set off up the vertiginous gorge, equipped with nose crampons, block and tackle, flask, because at six and a half quid I wasn't leaving half a jug behind, the telephone number of the mountain rescue team, and unfortunately an empty lighter, which I didn't realise was empty until halfway to the summit. The next five hours, five bloody hours were spent suffering from nicotine withdrawal. Our first destination was an outcrop of rock known locally as the Bride's Chair. In times long past it was used for fertility rites, brides on their wedding day being forced to sit on the limestone promontory to ensure an abundance of healthy sprogs. It was difficult to know exactly which outcrop was the bride's chair, however. We suspect it was this one. A couple of hikers were having lunch on it, which didn't help. Despite us coughing loudly and hoping to COVID them into buggering off, they continued to picnic on the hanging rocks at their leisure. The trouble is, there are no markers denoting the various caves, standing stones, monuments, etc. In fact, other than the phone number for the Samaritans, understandably placed at the edge of the quarry, the only signs on Wharton Crag are the occasional red arrow denoting the long route, estimated time two and a half hours, and yellow arrow, short route, estimated time one and a half hours. Five hours we spent on that rock. Five bloody hours without a cigarette. We continued along the slippery limestone pavement into the realm of red kites and gnats. The view from the Hulper Crags is impressive, which is more than can be said for the footage of it. Health and safety doesn't feature largely up Wharton Crag. We read somewhere recently of at least one person who'd plummeted off the edge, possibly the quickest but not necessarily the best route back down to the car park. Our second recce point was the Dog Holes, a pothole designated as an ancient monument because it's been inhabited since ancient times. Between 1909 and 1913, J.W. Jackson unearthed Neolithic bones from this twisted pit, along with beaker pottery, Roman pot shards, an intaglio brooch, iron knives and tons of other stuff. He was lucky. We couldn't even find the dog holes. As you've probably gathered from the fact that we had to make a photograph from Google Images, we got lost instead. Five bloody hours. The problem is that Warden Crag is a nature reserve nowadays, which basically means that the whole lot's been turned into a bramble-infested wilderness. As a result, you can't see anything unless you're on stilts, because everywhere's covered in eight-foot-high briars. There's no birdsong anywhere on the crag, 
the only nature it seems to be preserving, are the horseflies and the ticks. After stumbling about dangerously over vertigo-inducing drops for some considerable time, we found ourselves on a mysterious Lost World-type plateau. The Iron Age fort surmounting the summit, potentially attainable directly above us, via a natural cleft in the rock face. A sickeningly narrow convoluted Jacob's Ladder of a climb which, once again, our footage does not do justice. We're not young, especially Jeannie McIntosh, who's probably well into her 80s. I was suffering from dizziness brought on by a lack of nicotine. Regardless of these factors, we continued upwards. We didn't have much choice, accompanied now by auditory hallucinations of Miranda come back. Over the final ridge, we found the trigonometry point. Not that it was much use. Trig points are employed to take sightings of other landmarks with dumpies in order to establish their height above sea level. The only landmarks you could see from this particular viewing platform were the 12 foot high nettles surrounding it. Somebody, a bunch of school kids by the looks of it, had erected a beacon nearby, presumably to alert the authorities should any wayward interlopers such as us find ourselves in dire straits. Despite our predicament, we didn't light it because of the towering bone-dry undergrowth. We didn't want the whole crack to burn down. It was now around 1600 hours and we were completely lost. We might have been in the centre of the Iron Age fort. We might have been in Cumbria. There was no way of telling. So we struck out randomly working on the principle that if we were going downhill, then at least we were heading in the direction of civilization. Unfortunately, everything headed downhill from that point onwards, in more ways than one. We reached the entrance to the much-anticipated Three Brothers and the Rocking Rocks, glacially deposited boulders with their own folkloric interpretations, no doubt. However, the landowner had decided that he didn't want us there, and had nailed a sign to the tree informing us that the stones were now out of bounds. There was even a lock on the stile. So we left down, or sometimes up, Occupation Road, following the base of the crag back round to our original starting point. The sheep now casting elongated shadows as the sun sank behind a Morecambe Bay. My veins creaking through the lack of cigarette smoke. Occupation Road has steps built into it because it's steep. Everywhere was blanketed with lush swathes of moss, creating mugwumps from the boulders and fallen trees. But the footage looked awful. If nothing else, we now know the limitations of our camera. En route back to the old school brewery, another death-defying scramble over narrow causeways and treacherous gullies, we were hoping to film the Fairy Hole, our ultimate planned folkloric, unsignposted, buried beneath the brambles attraction. We couldn't find it, of course. It seems that the fairies were deliberately amazing us that evening. And as far as I'm concerned, the fairies can f***.